Let's just see if I'm being heard. I am. I can hear myself. It's great. Well, I'm just going to talk to you. I was. I wrote. I did actually write out a a long thing here, and I decided to time it last night, and I read it out loud to myself in my study back in Vermont. It took an hour and a half, <laughs> and I saw I'm scheduled to speak for half an hour <laughs> and take questions. So I thought, in true uh, teacherly fashion, to hell with it. I'll just talk. I'll just talk to them to tell you about this book. Uh, um, Blake, thank you uh, for that lovely introduction, and uh, I'm sorry you didn't take my modern poetry class. It's one of the popular courses at Middlebury College every year. Uh, I, vast crowds take my course every fall. I've taught that course for 35, this will be my 35th year teaching it this next fall, so uh, I love the teaching that particular course of many courses I teach. Um, <clears throat> but this book, Promised Land, came about when about three years ago, I was in London with my wife and my youngest of three kids who spent the year at the University of London. I was there as a visiting something or other. And um, uh, my wife said, there's a talk at the church that we attended um, down the road tonight, and we should go to it. And I thought, oh, I don't know about that. I thought, what's the subject? She said, it's 12 Books That Changed the World by Lord um, Melvin Bragg. So she dragged me along, and I said, okay. And I saw that it was, the church was far more crowded that night than ever was on Sunday morning. And I saw that uh, this book was a huge bestseller. And uh, I thought, hmm. And I'm sitting there listening to Lord Bragg. It's a great name, isn't it? Lord Bragg. A very pompous guy. Uh, almost a fool, I would say. But uh, leave that, that, be that as it may. Uh, he, bra he bragged and bragged about these books that changed the world. And they were all English books, you know, uh, Newton's Principia Mathematica, Darwin's Origins of the Species, Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations, and so forth. And I thought, wow, what? No, uh, nothing but English books changed the world? And I, and I began in my getting bored with the speech, I started, took out my pen, and I started scribbling in my notes of uh, the program. What would be the 12 books that changed America? And believe me, by the end of that talk, I knew I was going to write this book. Uh, but it's funny, as I was going out the door of the church, my wife said to me, Jay, she said, you should write a book about the books that changed America. I said, what do you think I was doing in there? <laughs> I was writing down all the books, and I began emailing all my friends around the world who are scholars and saying, what would be the 12 books that changed America? Really changed America. Not books, not important books, but, but real, we're talking about earth-shaking books that shifted American consciousness, that somehow developed the contours of the American mind. I wanted the great ones. And, uh, and I know that nobody really reads poetry or much fiction, really. You know, I was, and, and uh, so I, for me, it was a great strain not to put poetry on there. But I wanted books that, books that really somehow affected the American character. I, wanted, I think that books provide the DNA of, the, of a nation's character. And I wanted to trace the DNA of the American character. And so I wanted to go, so my first thought was, OK, Federalist Papers has to be on there. And, that, and it is. When I, immediately, I just knew you have to have Federalist Papers. You have to have Walden. I would not write this book without Walden. I thought, well, the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin must be on there. And then I then started getting up for grabs. And I said, well, Uncle Tom's Cabin is one novel that really switched things. So I put that on there. I put on The Grapes of Wrath because I love it and because it did change things and because I wrote John Steinbeck's biography, but then I took it off. So I had a lot of that. Um, in fact, I went half mad putting this book because I wanted to also be the book to be representative of all phases of the American, of American history and consciousness, all the different tendencies. I wanted westward expansion. So one book for westward expansion. So I thought, the greatest book of Westward Expansion, I'll put on there. It's the jour Journals of Lewis and Clark. So I did that. I wanted the, the Puritans. So I put on the first book by the great American Governor Bradford of the Plymouth, of Plymouth Plantation. Right? He came on the Mayflower. He was governor of the, Massage, of the uh, Plymouth colony there for two, three decades. And he wrote the most astonishing memoir of the Plymouth, uh, Plymouth Plantation. It's called a Plymouth Plantation. That's my first one. Um, I knew I needed something to, sh to, to deal with African-American history, and that drove me crazy. 
uh, I finally chose just the one that I thought was the best and the most interesting as a way for thinking about the discourse of race in America. And that was The Souls of Black Folk by W.E.B. Du, du Bois. I, 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 fight, I fought between that and Up From Slavery. And those books are in many ways written in tandem. I mean, uh, The Souls of Black Folk was written in response to Up From Slavery, which was 1900, uh, Du Bois 1903. So in a sense, I got a twofer there, sort of like Bill and Hillary Clinton, right? <laughs> so I was able to do, write about those two books and so forth. I'll talk about all the books I did in a minute, but just giving you, filling you in on my process here. And I finally had to go with 13. I simply could not think of a way of paring it down to less than 13. I thought, well, I need an excuse for saying 13 books that changed America. My wife said, well, we had 13 original colonies. Bingo. Right, it's a gimmick, but who cares? <laughs> I had fun with it. And um, I had a whale of a time writing this book. I mean, these were books, for the most part, that I've been teaching for, for, I've been teaching for nearly 40 years now. I don't look that old, but I am. And uh, <laughs> I've been teaching for 40 years. I first started teaching American literature in 1968, University of, uh, in uh, not about 1970, really. Um, and uh, ever since then, I've been teaching it. So uh, it's been a long time on the road here. But uh, these were books that I knew practically by heart, most of these books, read many, many, many times over and over. And um, I'll tell you a little bit about the books I chose and, and how I think they affected the American character. And for those who, who every, and of course, uh, any book like this, the review, every reviewer says, how could he have left off X, Y, or Z, right? You can, I could see that coming a mile away. So I actually did an appendix, which, was, which is called 100 more books that changed America. <laughs> and I give a little mini essay on 100 more books. So that's got Moby Dick and Frost and Whip, Fleas of Grass. Um, one of the books I, I really wanted to do was The Great Gatsby, because it's one of my favorite books. So, and I just at the very last second decided not to do that, and I forgot to put it on my 100 more books. So The Great Gatsby is not mentioned anywhere. So these, it's a fallible thing. Can, you can imagine? do a tracking on a task like this. Nevertheless, I'm pretty happy with, with the result here. I think that the book, as I began to write it, I realized all of these books were in a state of kind of call and response. Not one of these books stands alone. What I say is that every, a book is not just a single book, but it's really um, a climate of opinion. And for every one of these books, there's books that swirl around it. And so, you know, you can't have the souls of black folk without, say, Booker T. Washington. You can't have Booker T. Washington without Fre the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass. And, and, and all of these, in those, in those books, anticipate books like Invisible Man and, you know, James Baldwin and so forth. So, in a sense, what I'm writing, although I'm focusing on one book in each of the 13 chapters, I write about the tradition of that kind of writing, the tradition of books about westward expansion, the tradition of books about nature. Walden gave birth to, oh God, thousands of books, right? Pilgrim at Tinker Creek and so forth. So each of these books represents a tradition, a kind of route that the American mind has taken. And what I hope is it presents a kind of interesting portrait of the American mind as it developed over several, several centuries. Going right back to the first one, which is a remarkable book <coughs> of Plymouth Plantation <coughs> by Governor Bradford. But Governor Bradford, Bradford kept this journal. He was the governor of this small colony. Uh, they were separatists from England who had been living on the continent because they got kicked out of England because they were separatists and didn't go along with the Church of England. And they could see that there were going to be, that trouble was coming even in, on the continent. Um, so they, Spain was taking over, and so they had to get out. So they migrated on the Mayflower to America, landed, and, and it, it's a very interesting story of their, the first 50 years of, of English people living in America and, and, and their relation with the Wampanoag Indian, Indians. And one of the great themes of this book is the relationship between the various immigrant groups. There are so many, right? And the Native American population, uh, and just the whole incredible panorama of American immigration, which is one of my great themes in the book. I say, you know, I mean, obviously, I mean, I'm from an Italian-American family. My grandparents were, came on the boat 
from southern Italy in 1910, 11, 12. So I understand about that whole thing, but um, teaching at Dartmouth and Middlebury and Oxford and so forth, I've been with all these snobby, waspy people, and I always say, remember, you guys are just immigrants just like my family. The immigrant, what were the people who came on the Mayflower but intruders and immigrants? And don't even think that wasps were the main immigrants of this country. You look around, you see that Spaniards were here before them for the most part. The Spaniards are the real core of America. They were here you know, for a long time, uh, even before uh, the, the uh, white, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. Germans were here in big quantities. The Dutch were hugely influential, and so forth and so on. There's been a rich, complex tradition of immigration in America for a very long time. And I talk about that whole tradition specifically in my chapter called The Promised Land, based on the book Promised Land by Mary Anson, which I think is a marvelous immigrant narrative, which essentially lays down the, the design, or, or if you will, the paradigm for immigration. It's always the same story. You're living in a foreign country under the boot of the law. You're, you're uh, in a displaced group, or you're, poor, you're a poor Italian, or you're a poor Jew in the Palo Settlement. You're a poor uh, Polish person, or whatever. And then you dream, you hear about this place where the streets are paved with gold. My grandmother taught me about that. Many of you will remember stories like that. You get on the immigrant ship, and you journey. My grandparents always told me about the great immigrant ships, and people dying on board, and bodies being tossed overboard, and so forth. You get to the country, you come in through the Statue of Liberty. I've gone there with my sons and showed them the Statue of Liberty. I said, this means so much to me, and it does. And I say, but you know, when these immigrants came, they realize they're shuffled in with zillions of other poor immigrants. And it's a long struggle for equality. It's a long struggle to rise up in the culture. You know, I was the first person in my vast extended family ever to go to college. My parents didn't even go to high school. So it's a long, it's a generational thing. It takes time, it takes application. I mean, so I have a very deep appreciation for the immigrant tradition and how it goes back to Governor Bradford, who writes about it beautifully, about trying to assimilate, trying to make sense of this wilderness, trying to make friends with the Wampanoag. Uh, uh, it's a beautiful story of, of, of getting along with the people around you over, in difficult times, perseverance so forth, I recommend of, of, of Plymouth Plantation as one of our great founding books, myth-making books. Well, the whole, for, also these books are myth-making books, the American Thanksgiving, right? We all think about, if in second grade, we learn about first grade, we learn about the pilgrims and the Indians and how they shared the first Thanksgiving. Well, we assume that from the beginning that was a great holiday, right? No, uh, a Plymouth Plantation was a book that Governor Bradford wrote in a, the journal. He finished it in uh, 1642, and then it disappeared. It was not discovered till a traveler, an American traveler, found it in the library of the Bishop of London's house, in manuscript in London, just as the Civil War was breaking out in the middle of the 19th century. He copied it out by hand, brought it back, it was published, it was hugely successful as a story of how people could get along. And Abraham Lincoln read it and said, wow, Thanksgiving would be a great holiday. And so in 1862 or three, he declares Thanksgiving a national holiday. Well, most Americans don't know that, right? It's a pretty, I, I, in fact, I've, one thing I've discovered in going talking about this book around the country, which I've done now, is this is the United States of amnesia. <laughs> people don't know their own history. And so you're constantly, uh, you know, you're really shocking people over and over again just by telling them who they are, where they came from, and what contributed to this thing, the American mind, right? Um, it's, 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 it's fun being in a presidential library of Bill Clinton because he was one of the, our few American presidents of recent memory who actually seemed to have an American mind and could actually talk. I used to always. Even Ronald Reagan, I used to say he read his speeches with a great sense of discovery. <laughs> you know? Remember that time on TV when he came on, he said, I, I'm, uh, my fellow Americans, we've just in, in, in invaded Grenada? <laughs> Looking off to the wings? You know, who did this? <laughs> 
So, um, you know, it's great fun to go back and recover our tradition, to understand who we are and where we came from. The second book I do is probably the most important one for us as a nation, the Federalist Papers, right? 85 essays written in newspapers in, 18, in, in 1787 and 1887 and 8 in defense of the new Constitution as constructed in Philadelphia at the great convention of 1787, right? And, um, and Alexander Hamilton and James Madison were there, present at the creation. And John Jay uh, wasn't there, but he, was, uh, he, had, he had actually written the New York State Constitution. So these were terrifically um, well-placed men. They were, they were astonishing. We were very lucky in our founding fathers. These were Enlightenment intellectuals, right? Enlightenment intellectuals. They'd read their Montesquieu. They'd read their Roman historians and philosophers. They knew their Greek political philosophy. They were largely secular, and they were the inventors of the first great secular state, which is what this is, and that's so essential. This is a secular republic that has to be stressed over and over and over again, and any American who ever dares move toward anything against that should, should be banished, you know, sent to, sent, if they want to live in, in, in in an Islamic or Christian republic, there are many examples of that. You don't want to go near them. This is a secular enlightenment country, right? And these founding fathers were, they, they might have been Christians, they were largely deists, but they were tremendously interested in intellectual history and how governments are put together. And the Federalist Papers are an astonishingly good read. You can learn so much from reading them. Um, um, so, you know, when you look, if you've read the U.S. Constitution, which I can recommend to you, I mean, very few of my students have ever really read it. I always say to my classes, look, the first thing, Simon, just go out and read the U.S. Constitution. I pass it out. It's very short. It'll take you about two hours or an hour. It's a very short document. In fact, it, that's why there's so much d debate over it. I mean, the Federalist Papers is, you know, 85 long essays, and it fleshes out the U.S. Constitution. Right, for instance, there's no such thing as the doctrine of the separation of powers. It's implicit in the Constitution, but there's no doctrine. Uh, even though Justice Brandeis and Justice Earl Warren and so many Supreme Court decisions refer specifically to the Constitution's theory or doctrine of the separation of powers, even though there is so no, no such thing in the Constitution. Um, still, Thomas Jefferson said that um, he would refer anyone to the Federalist Papers find out what the Founding Fathers really meant. And it's tremendously interesting reading. Um, you know, I've just la last night in bed, for instance, I, I just for some reason picked it up. I always keep it by my bedside. I love reading the Federalist Papers. And I just happened to pick up number three. And I turned to a page where it's, um, it's John Jay wrote three. And he says, um, he said he was really worried about, um, it, ab about the powers to make war and so forth, as discussed in the Constitution. He said, it's, he said, what we really have to do is restrain. He said, we don't have to worry so much about invasions from outside. We have to worry about the warlike tendencies that arise in the human heart naturally. And he said, I'm more worried about what we're going to do to the Native American population of this country than I am about invaders from abroad. I'm whew, reading that, I thought, you know, and it's that's the kind of thing. You read the Federalist Papers, and again and again you're thinking, Whoa, these guys knew what they were talking about. It's, it's a pretty radical document. This was the first radical democratic experiment in the history of the world, modern world, shall we say, right? And, uh, and it's a pretty adventurous reading. And also, what's interesting is how the Founding Fathers were not sure that they necessarily had it right. It was a, there was a huge tradition of anti-Federalist papers, right? A lot of people were arguing, don't do it. This, this is a crazy document. So it's worth remembering there was a huge debate about this thing. And even Ben Franklin, who was the presiding eminent grise, the old man at the 18, he was pretty, pretty doddering. But at the end of the last day of the convention, old Ben stood up and he actually, I think I know where I, I have a little thing he said. I always love looking at it. Yeah, he stands up and he says, this is Ben Franklin, last day of the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia. My friends, I agree to this Constitution 
with all of its many faults because I think a general government is probably necessary for us. And there is no form of government but what may be a blessing to the people if well administered for a course of years. But it can only end in despotism as other forms have done before it when the people shall become so corrupted as to need despotic government being incapable of any other. Good day, my friends. So let's, you know, when we think about these founding fathers, they were a lively group, many different opinions, and it's pretty vigorous stuff. It's a bracing to read the Federalist Papers, I can guarantee you. You know, especially when you start thinking about the construction of Supreme Courts, it's very, very vivid reading. Uh, you can see, and, and, and you hear all of this frankly, horseshit about strict constructionist judges. And you see, see what, um, what, what, what James Madison and Alexander Hamilton had to say about that idea. So it's very interesting stuff to read. Moving on, let me just, I'm not gonna be able to talk about everything in my book. I'm not, I'm not gonna be able to lay out the American mind before you. <laughs> you can be rest assured, relaxed, yes, thank God. Um, a couple of books that were fun to write. You know, there are a couple of oddities in here. As I said, I do the, some of the great things here. I do the Federalist Papers, the autobiography of Ben Franklin, where we see the American character up from the bootstraps, marvelous stuff invented. Uh, we see Walden, this beautiful, the great, I think of this as the presiding spiritual document of this country, Walden, by a great secularist in a way, but spiritual, almost a deist. I don't know what you would call Henry David Thoreau but he's my spiritual guide. I go for a long walk in the woods in Vermont every day, an hour and a half. And there's never a day I step into the woods that I don't think of Walden, which I've read a hundred times at least. You know, and I just love, you know, that chapter, where I live and what I live for. He said, I went into the woods to live, learn to live deliberately, right? To front the essential facts of life so that when I came to die, I would know that I had really lived. And it's a book that teaches you how to live properly in yourself, in your world, among your neighbors. It's a great, I mean, the great theme of so many of these books is independence. And when did, Wald, when did Henry David go to Walden Pond? It was not accident. He went on July 4th. He said, I'm going to declare, July 4th, 1845. He picks up his things, his little bag, and says, here I go, baby, bye, mama to Walden Pond, and he builds himself a cabin, and he lives there. And, and it's, he worked for 10 years on this magnificent document. If you've never read it, you have before you one of the great experiences of human life, is to read Walden slowly and carefully and to understand the, de the depths of the truth in this work. It's powerful stuff. Um, as I said, I do these great works, but I also do some fun ones. The two books that are kind of outliers are, um, I do, uh, I do um, 1936, Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. And I do 1946, I do Dr. Spock's book, Common Sense Book of Baby and Child Care. Right, those were world-changing books. You know, I, I say in my little preface to my chapter on Dale Carnegie, this book changed my own life. I was a shy boy, immigrant Italian family, nobody went to college in West Granton, Pennsylvania in a school that was very, very, very low, believe me, in its educational resources. I was also, you know, couldn't get along with anybody. I was, looked around me and I didn't know how to talk to these people or what to do, what to say. I was, I was pathologically shy. My mother was called in to, to take me to a psychologist at the school because they said I was backward. So one day in the seventh grade, I was in this department store and it was a little book rack and I saw a paperback how to win friends and influence people. And I thought, that's for me, baby. So I read this book, and, he, and ben, it's tremendous advice all the way through, believe me, it's good. And he says, the main thing you must do, he says, is keep a notebook and chart your progress. And he tells you things to do. And keep a, so, so I did, one of his advice I did, I went around, I wrote down the name of every single kid in my class, my seventh grade homeroom. And, and Carnegie says, Find something to admire in every one of those people. So 
so I did. It took me a long time, three weeks in some cases. You know, I said there was a guy called Joe who was a great, you know, junior high, high quarterback. I said, that's easy. So I went up to him and I said, Joe, I said, I had never spoken to him before. I said, the way you throw a football, I said, wow, where did you get that? He was a friend for life. He still emails me. It's unbelievable. He works, he works in a garage in Scranton, PA. And, you know, there was a woman called, let's call her Kathy. She had, there was nothing to be said for Kathy, poor thing. I mean, she was, you know, everything had worked against her, shall we say. She weighed about 400 pounds. She talked to nobody. She got acne. Everything that could go wrong with an adolescent had gone wrong with Kathy. And so I, for three weeks, I followed her around thinking, what am I going to write in my notebook? And then one day, in Sp in, we had an elementary Spanish conversation class. I heard her say, butter in Spanish, burro. I said, wow. And I went up to her after class, and I said, Kathy, the way you pronounce burro, you could be like Spanish. You know, she would have married me that day. <laughs> Talk about a friend for life. Now, so I went around, I literally went around the class, and I did this. And, you know, eventually I became president of the class. And, uh, you know, it, uh, and, you know uh, everything started picking up. My grades picked up. Everything I really date back to reading that book and learning how to get ahead in life, how to deal with people. And it's a very common sense book. And, and I go through the book. I, I say it has some, it obviously has some very downsides as well. You know, the, it, and on the upside, I see it as essentially a book of spiritual truth. That, in fact, it's not about you. It's about getting along with people and, and, and genuinely looking and saying, who are these people and, and, what, and noticing who's in front of you. That's all it's about. The downside can be, you know, as Carnegie a little bit has this thing, it's 1930s depression stuff. Flatter your boss to get ahead, you know? But still, it's good advice, like make the boss think your ideas are his idea. That kind of thing, right? That's all Dale Carnegie, too. But I, I elaborate all of that, and I talk about how this book has led to huge tradition of self-help books. I mean, Dale Carnegie sold 50 million copies. A friend of mine in England showed me in a book he had on Glasnost how between 1989 and the fall of the communism in Soviet Russia, turning into Russia, and in the first decade, Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People in Russian went through 18 editions. So, you know, that book has been immensely popular worldwide, and it's led to all these other books, many of them very good. One thing I did was I went into my local bookstore, and I simply bought the whole shelf of self-help books and took them home and spent a couple of months just reading them. You know, I, and some of them are quite good. Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, very good. The Purpose Driven Life, I thought that was very well done. Some of them are truly awful. I mean, uh, one guy... I hate to, I, 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 I say what's on my mind I'm, as a teacher and as a speaker, so you'll forgive me, but there was one guy called Joel Austin, and it horrified me. It struck me as anti-religious and anti-American in the worst sorts of ways. So, you know, uh, you, you know in fact, I happened to be in a, a traveling this, uh, just recently, and I caught him on a television show. I'd never watched him before because I don't watch television, except when I travel and I can't sleep. And he came on the television and he said, uh, you know, I'll paraphrase, but this is more or less what he said. He said, you know, uh, my wife, let's call her Cynthia, and I were, you know, we're driving down the street and we came upon this beautiful mansion. And I said, Cynthia, we should be living in that house. God loves us. She said, uh, Joel, we can't afford that house. Uh, God may love us, but our bank account you know, doesn't have that kind of money in it. It's so ridiculous. And he said, he said you don't be of little faith, Cynthia. So I said, come out here. We got on the lawn, and we prayed in front of this big house. God, give us this big house. Three weeks later, I'm telling you, God delivered into our hands this big house. Everybody cheered. So this is like the worst aspect of American life, right? This is like the failure of the American dream. Not the, this is not what it's about. This is, this, this is really the opposite of the American dream. You know, instead, of, instead of telling people, you know, Get, the, the real message should be God wants you to love your neighbor. That is the message. I'm a Christian, and that is the message of Christianity. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's not pray for a big house. That really just, that just disgusted me. Sorry to vent on you all. <laughs> 
but I was so, I almost threw up on my motel room bed when I saw that guy saying that. So um, their book is uh, Dr. Spock. And I use that book. I've raised three kids with my wife pretty successfully. The oldest one's getting married in two weeks. So, um, and Dr. Spock, believe me, was, is still right there on our bedroom bookshelf. And I've gone back to that book again and again and again. And my mother used that book. That book was originally written for those mothers in the mid-40s, you know, especially 1946, so right after the war, right? And, and, and in the old, it really, it, it, there was a huge shift in how we raised children, brought about by that book, which has gone through edition after edition after edition. And I love the first line of the book. You, this would be a great comfort to me when my first child was born, a friend put that book in my hand, I opened it up, it said, you know more than you think you do. He's empowering the parent to say, trust your common sense. Don't go by some rigid rules here. Use your common sense. If a child is, uh, is crawling toward an electrical outlet, says Dr. Spock, remove the electrical outlet. Don't spank the kid, say, you bad little one-year-old. Don't you know about electrical outlets? Whatever, you know? It's common sense, you know? Uh, and it's wonderful, good reading, and it's shifted with, I talk about how the book has shifted over the generations as it keeps getting rewritten and rewritten and rewritten. Like, the, I, I did get, I went to some trouble to get the original edition of each one of the, of, of, you know, many editions, so I could track the changes. You know, in, in 1946, he was telling you, you know, take, be sure to give your kid lots of castor oil. Yeah. Nobody does that anymore. So forth. So I, I had fun with that. So those were two fun books, Dale Carnegie and Dr. Spock. I'm running out of time, I can see. Uh, but I do want to get to um, just a couple of the more books here. Um, I also talk about, um, toward the end, I rarely get to talk about the two books at the end, but I will, so I'm going to rush to the end here. Um, I usually get mired in the Federalist Papers, and I never get out of there. <laughs> right? I go on about the, I, I was giving a thought talk in Los Angeles a, uh, not to, a few weeks ago, and uh, I started up like it's like this, and I got onto the Federalist Papers an hour and a half later. I was still on the Federalist Papers. So I have to, but I'm going to skip ahead. I never get to talk about the last two books. I'm going to say a word about them. The last two books on my list are, um, well, the very last book is Betty Friedan, The Feminine Mystique, right? And uh, let's just talk about that book. Let's leave it there. And then we'll take your questions. I think that's an important book. It came out in 1964. And it really was the book that epitomized, well, maybe initiated, maybe gathered to, I mean, it's hard to say whether these books is chicken and egg thing. Did they really change things, or did they simply pull together many things that were happening in the culture? You know, you had the first wave of feminism in America, I mean, it goes back to Seneca Falls and the early suffragettes, you know. My students at Middlebury are often stunned when I tell them that when my mother was was, a, was born, women did not have the right to vote. Women couldn't vote in this country until 1920, right? It's shocking. Um, my students never like it when I lay out some statistics that I get from ordinary magazines about, to this day, uh, the expectations for men and women are so profoundly different. And, and you, know, you just look at the Supreme Court. How many women are on the Supreme Court right now? Uno? Uh, how many women are CEOs of the four, top 500 fortune companies? I don't want to tell you. Was it seven? Yeah, seven. Uh, and on and on and on, in every walk of life. Uh, I used to hold up the Norton Anthology of Poetry to my first year class, and I'd say, this is the Norton Anthology of Poetry from Beowulf to uh, 20th century. Why is it that in century after century after century after century after century of English literature, there was not one woman poet. I say, what is it with you girls? Can't you write poetry? Are you just dumb when it comes to poetry? Is it a macho thing? Well, you have to think about these things, you know? It's worth thinking about. What's going, what, what, what went wrong in 800 years of English poetry? That no woman got published. Many of, as we know, a lot of women did actually write poetry. 
but they didn't get their poems published, at least not in such a way that an anthologist would ever put them in the book. Betty Friedan raises lots and lots and lots of uncomfortable issues. She made me squirm at, on every page. To this day, it's electrifying reading. This was a book that shot through the American population like a thunderbolt. It actually shifted things. People started talking about what is the real role of women? How sh what is equality in marriage? What are, how should we think about women in society? This is called the second wave of feminism. Right? Women go back, should go back to work. Third wave is, is let's have a more complex, let's think about this thing more com in complex ways. What about, say, Betty Friedan does not take any into account, for example, any issues of race. There are lots of holes in her work. In each of these books, I never say these are books without holes. Every single one of them has problems. A book is something that has something wrong with it. And I try to give a whole picture of each of these books and to even provide the counter-narrative, what is the a view, re, a attitude of the anti-federalists? What is the case against Betty Friedan, right? So forth. Well, in, it, for me, it was an exhilarating experience. I felt like I journeyed back through the entire intellectual history of the United States. I certainly learned a huge amount. I loved rereading these books. Only one of them had I never read before, Uncle Tom's Cabin. I couldn't believe I'd never read it. And I started reading it one Saturday morning, and it was like, you know, Stephen King on steroids. Amazing storyteller. And I can see it's electrifying to read. I'd often wondered about this book. You know, it, after the Bible, it was the second most popular book as far as sales in the United States, right? Second most popular book in, in the whole 19th century. It was a worldwide phenomenon. For three decades, the publishers had to keep eight printing presses going 24-7 just to keep up with the demand. You can't even begin to imagine success on a scale like this. In 1862, Abraham Lincoln welcomed Mrs. Harriet Beecher Stowe to the White House. He stood tall above her and she looked down at this little woman and he says, so you're the little lady that started this great war. And to a certain extent she had. She mobilized abolitionist opinion in the, in the North, for sure, and made that war possible. And she, she galvanized people. So that was a really earth-changing you know, book. And it's actually a mind-changing book to this day to read it. It's shocking, and it's beautifully written and moving. Well, I'm going to stop there and take your questions, OK? So who will give me a question? All right, How let's take, first of all, let's give Jay a hand. Thank you. Questions. Tell us about your movie. Well, I'm a, you know, I've, I've, I've written seven or eight novels, actually, and one of my novels is about the last days in the life of Leo Tolstoy, called The Last Station. When it came out in 1990, it was very successful. It's front page New York Times Book Review, lots of stuff. It's, it, it's, um, it came out, it was very popular at the time, and I got a phone call from Anthony Quinn, the old Hollywood actor. Jay Perini. Yes. Anthony Quinn. I thought it was my uncle. <laughs> I, I said, Uncle Tony, what are you doing that Anthony Quinn voice for? He said, it's Jay Perini. It's Anthony Quinn. I said, holy God, it is Anthony Quinn. <coughs> and he said, I want to be Tolstoy. And he said, you come on down to New York tomorrow. Let's have lunch and talk it over. So I immediately flew to New York the next day. Like, how could I resist? I loved Zorba the Greek. We had lunch at the Russian Tea Room, and Quinn, this massive figure, said to me, Perini, we're going to do this together. I'm going to be Tolstoy. So we started working on the script, and I would go down to New York, or he'd come up to Vermont. It went on for years, endlessly, trying to get the right script, trying to raise the money for it. By 2000, we were ready to roll. We had our 50 million bucks in the bank. We had, Quinn was dancing up and down, ready to play Zorba the Ruski. And Tony dropped dead. So it was sad. He was a dear friend of mine. And the, the movie collapsed with it. The financing disappeared. And so, but I've been working with a producer, Bonnie Arnold, who had produced Dances with Wolves. And she and I kept working and working. We finally got other actors involved, got a director, re-raised the money. 
And so we, we shot this about a year ago in uh, Saxon-Anhalt, Eastern Germany, with uh, uh, Christopher Plummer plays Tolstoy. Helen Mirren plays Sophia Tolstoy, and she's fabulous. Uh, Paul Giamatti plays Tolstoy's best friend and publisher, and Tolstoy's young student, who's, from whose point of view my novel is told and the movie is told, is James McAvoy, who's the star of Atonement and uh, many movies. So I'm very lucky with my cast, and the director is a guy called Ho Michael Hoffman, who's quite brilliant. Uh, it's lovely. Uh, the, the Russians gave us money to ha hire their best uh, composer, Sergei Yevtushenko, who's a relative of the poet, and he wrote a beautiful score. Uh, so it's coming out in, uh, in September, October. Go to the movies. <laughs> and the book is coming out in 31 languages in September. I didn't know there were 31 languages. Strong cast, strong cast. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes. Age of media multiplicity. Do you think there are books being published today that have the potential to change the American mind again? Mm, that's a great question. Uh, I cut it off at 1964 because it's very difficult to know what books are, are, are going to be seen in 20 or 30 or 40 years as books that really made a huge difference on the American character. So that's why I cut it off in 1964 and I say, look, I just don't know how to judge more recent stuff. I'm sure there are books. There will be books. What will they be? Will they be, you know, in, in my hundred books that changed America, the last book I do is the Al Gore book about global warming. So it's possible that this would be a book. I doubt it, but it's possible that this would be one of the books that shifted America's ideas about ecology or global warming. I certainly think, you know, that's something that need, looking back, we may say, well, where did that cha which change come about? How did we start to realize that the planet was in jeopardy? And how did we, what, was there a book that really shifted America's thinking on this? You know, maybe uh, the Al Gore book. You know, it's a real, it's anybody's guess at this, at, you know, and this close to, to, to history. Another question. Got one right yes, here. Wait for the, get the mic. Along those same lines, are there any books, have you had any afterthoughts? Any afterthoughts about maybe you would, I hear what you're saying. Are there any? Did I? Yeah, well, you, mm, you know, yes. I mean, really, um, there's something necessarily arbitrary about the project. You get to be your di a dictator, and you choose these will be the books I'll write on. And I kind of just said, well, I'll go with it and stick with it. And I talk about so many other books. I think I might have. Doing it again, I might have gone back to put in Frederick, the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass. I think that was a profoundly important book in the 19th century, but I just don't know. So many books, people keep coming up to me saying, you know, you know, for instance, uh, many people, many people emailed me or wrote to me or seized me by the wrist to say, how could you have left off the book about the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous? Uh, I can't even remember the guy's name, but, but that, that book. So, I mean, uh, you'd be amazed how many people come up to me, you know, in, in sense that I left off what they consider their favorite book, you know. But uh, Any other questions? it's a bit of a mug game. One. Yes. Here you go, Andy, wait for the mic. When you get to the When you talked about the books, they really are a reflection of the character of our country, and so they would be of others. My question is that many times we hear so much discussion about we may not have newspapers, but what your book represents to me is it's a library. It's yeah. a miniature library. And when I think in terms of this city in particular, the growth of public libraries yeah. and who goes into them, when I have gone up to the homeless people, yeah. there are lots of people who think they're there because they're trying to find a cool place or a warm place. But if you check to see what they're reading, I believe that many of them are looking at America as a way to cope with what's happening in America. And if that's so, do you believe that the concept now that we're becoming an illiterate based on the scores that Americans have in public school and in college, 
Do you believe that mm. the love of books will turn that around the illiteracy and that books are the yeah. most illiterate tool that we have mm. to save our democracy? Well, I do think that books are what can save us and books are what shaped us. We are a people of the book. And in Mary Anton's Promised Land, when I talk about that book, she has a long chapter about the public library and how for the immigrant, that was what was her university. That's what saved her, Mary Anton. And, and I heard my uncles talking about uh, going when they were immigrants from Italy. My grandfather said the first thing he did was beat his way to the public library and he learned to read and he read everything. And, and, and my family became very successful because of the public library. That's what was there at Harvard and Yale was the public libraries. And, on, and even as a young boy growing up in Scranton, West Scranton, Pennsylvania, every day after school, I beat my path to the West Scranton Public Library, where the librarian there became my friend, my mentor, my advisor, Mrs. Godfrey, and she guided my reading. And it wasn't what the teachers were telling me to read, it was what Mrs. Godfrey said I should be reading. And the summer would come, Mrs. Godfrey would lay out the books for me, and I'd come and collect them, and I would go home and sit down to read. And, you know, I worked my way through her books, you know, Robert Louis Stevenson and so forth. Um, you know, I read Sir Walter Scott uh, at her behest and so forth. So um, I think public libraries are central to the possibilities of democracy in this country. Reading is the only way we're ever going to have maintain a country that is alert to its dangers as well as its possibilities. And I think without public libraries and books, we are in devastating trouble. So uh, I'm very worried. I think we have to keep fighting the good fight. Everybody in this room has to become a great supporter of libraries and reading. And uh, you know, with the decline of newspapers, that's a very worrying trend. Hopefully, you know, hopefully it's not a, a, a life-threatening thing, but it might be. I mean, I, I mean, the Federalist Papers tell us over and over again that this, this experiment in democracy is extremely fragile. It might, like you know, the Roman Republic, only last a few hundred years and then end in despotism. And it can happen if the people lose their edge, refuse to question authority at every turn. We have time for <coughs> one more question. Does anybody got a question? Yes, sir. Right back here the back. Uh, Hold on, we need it on the mic. They need it on, they need it on uh, they're, they're, they're making recording. a recording of this, I think. Uh, although I believe you probably adequately cover in your book uh, this subject, I'd love to hear your commentary for a minute or two on the journals of Lewis and Clark. Yeah, I'm sorry I didn't get more about that. You know, um, the journals of Lewis and Clark, remember, um, when, when Thomas Jefferson and his gang acquired, the Louis made the Louisiana Purchase, we way more than doubled the land mass size of the U.S., right? Suddenly we owned, as a nation, this vast territory going up the Missouri River and over the Columbia River, over to the Pacific. And um, Jefferson wisely thought, let's send uh, the Corps of Discovery, as he called it, a group of, 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 of very, very strong young men out, intelligent young men out, to explore the West and report back and tell us, well, what do we have here, right? The maps of the, of, of the West were completely inadequate. And so this incredible journey took place, one of the great American journeys. And in, in a sense, one of the great themes of, of all of these books is the road novel. From Jack Kerouac, uh, you can trace it back to Lewis and Clark. Kerouac talks about having read Lewis and Clark. And God inspired him to go west, right? In search of, of what? In search of paradise. He fell paradise. Uh, and goes in search of paradise. In search of the promised land. And that phrase, the promised land, comes up again and again and again. It's the great myth of the wandering tribes of Israel looking for the land of Canaan. And, and in a sense, Lewis and Clark very cleverly, you know, understood that this was an epic journey they were undertaking. And their diaries are some of the great American writings that can be found in those astonishing diaries. Now, they're, they're vast. I read through the 14-volume gold thwaite edition, but it's, you know, but there are many, every generation seems to have some abbreviated version of the journals of Lewis and Clark. But they're worth, if you can ever get the time, plowing your way through, because it's to see them going up the Missouri River, wondering which fork to take. Uh, and there are endless encounters with the Indians. They only survive by doing how to get along with the Native Americans. Who helped them? The Shoshone Indians. The help that Lewis and Clark got from, for example, Sakajuya, the famous Indian Shoshone, 
it, it was you know, uh, unbelievably important to the success of the, of the mission. So it's a thrilling adventure. The journals of the, the story of their 1803 to 1806 expedition. Uh, the fact that only one man died en route is astonishing. Um, they're, they're in, you see American inventiveness, the can-do thing. You see the American appreciation of nature. Uh, the nature writing is brilliant. You see the anthropological instincts, especially of uh, Meriwether Lewis in describing the various Indian tribes, the Mandan villages, the Shoshone, and so forth. Uh, lots of ingenuity in, in, you know, in, in, in making dugout canoes and skidding down the Columbia River at the end. Oh, it's a thrilling adventure story. It would make a great movie. It's probably already a great movie.